All right, so I'm going to be doing a another walking road rant, trying to get another mobility session here, shake off sitting at the desk, stretch out a little bit. Felt dramatically better after yesterday, so I'm going to try to keep that up. Also, take a few minutes to answer, I guess, or, or follow up on a request to do kind of my data analytics approach, projecting what the Patriots' record's going to be now that we know their schedule, who they're playing, when, all that, and try to come up with a, a, a modeling, a regression here of what the Patriots' record could be at the end of the season. So this is not nearly as hard as coming up with player profiles using that data analytics, you know, I did for Will Campbell and Landon Jackson and uh, Ted McMillan there. And I had so many more, but that, that, that was really time consuming, labor intensive. I mean, those guys I loved watching. So some of the other ones would have been probably pretty hard, especially when you don't have, you know, the technology really to get every single one of those players done. But now for the schedule, that's really easy, actually. I mean, I shouldn't say easy because it'll be accurate, but easy in terms of time. So that wasn't too bad, actually. Plenty of Excel spreadsheets and just throwing it through Python and R is not that bad at all. But let's talk it. We're going to get into it. So 2025 win projection model. So this is a data-driven multi-factor regression. Major things, there are quantifiable components that we need to talk about. One, year two QB delta. So we're ch talking about the change in EPA per play, completion percentage, touchdown interception, touchdown interception percentage for Drake May. Big thing next after that is coaching delta. So we're also going to throw in some defensive stability just in there. So that's for Mike Vrabel. Three. Free agent war added. So the guys they brought in, they have a major impact. Now, the other thing, rookie war added from the draft class. Also can throw in kind of a pending, sorry for the wind, latent war added from the 2024 class, which is harder to consider, but there's two guys that'll be in there, I think, that we can actually throw in. And then schedule adjusted win expectancy. That's S A W E. So that's like five or six components right there. Now each one produces an estimated win delta. So that's going over their baseline from 2024 for wins. So the biggest one, and I think everybody's favorite, is the second year QB development for Drake May, the delta from that. Now the key data set we're going back to is 2010. So second year QBs who played less than 10 as a rookie was expected to start more than 12 this year, which we hope, right? We're looking for EPA per play to be about 0 0.07, which will correlate to roughly two wins, a little bit less than that actually on average. Now there's some historical peers here. You got Justin Herbert, 2021, Lawrence, 2022, Josh Allen in 2019. Really the only outlier in the last several years will be Zach Wilson who lost a year. So the projection for May would be he's gonna have an expected jump of EPA per play, 0 0.065. So do that with adjusted O-line upgrades, wide receiver additions with uh, digs coming in, obviously, hopefully some improvements from the rest of the wide receivers. They're going to give you 0 0.03, sorry, 0 0.073. So that's going to translate to a win delta of 2.1 wins just from Drake May and things that they built around him. Now, new coaching adjustment for Vrabel. Now, the data set going back for that for since like 2000. Head coach is changing. Uh, so head coach changes from a low win team. So... Less than six wins, which would be the Patriots. 
to going to experienced head coaches with a greater than 500% uh, record get an average of 1.5 win bump. So Vrabel's Titans tenure, he was a plus 20% win percentage over Vitag. That puts him the top 10th percentile of quote unquote culture reset coaches. So guys who can come in, make a big change. So he's basically one of the best options for the Patriots coming in if they want a quick turnaround. The other thing that brings in is some defensive stability coefficient, DS. So and that's because Vrabel's defense is ranked top 12 in DVOA out of the four, four out of six years. So big thing, New England's 2024 D was around 14th EPA per play. So that was allowed because of poor field position, obviously some turnovers. So the projection there, just the base, just Rabel coming in, you got 1.3 wins coming in. Now you throw that DSC multiplier, you're going to get another 0.3 wins from Rabel. So 1.6 wins just from Rabel. Another big one, the top free agent spending. This is going to be a nice solid war differential here. So using PFF and then over and over the caps free agent valuation, the top five free agents typically over the last decade, the top five free agent spenders added 1.4 net wins via war. And that's basically adjusted for replacement level baseline. So taking the bad away, putting in some good, you should get a nice little bump, 1.4 wins when you are one of the top spenders in the off season. If greater than 60% of the spending was on non-QB starters, that bump actually goes up to 2.2. See that? So if you're a top spender and it's not on the QB, meaning you probably spread it out to a variety of guys, 2.2 wins. Now you can actually break that down to like war based upon the player. Steph Diggs should give you an estimated war of 0.75. Here, Landry, 0.31, Spillane, 0.19, Carlton Davis, 0.26, Moses, give me a 0.33, Milton's going to be give you 1.4, 0.14, and then Dobbs and Tonga going to give you 0.05. So an aggregate war between them is roughly two. So this free agent class should help you give you two wins. Now, late in draft class, so last year, so you're looking for some latent production here, increases in war. Jalen Polk, assuming he gets 70 targets, and if Kane Wallace actually has some starting potential, if you get that, you're going to get another 0.4 win out of it. Interesting, right? Now, you, what's another interesting angle to throw in there is that profile. If you're looking at profiles between wide receivers, you're essentially your best combination right now for war that would unlock one another for angles would be takes and Polk. Together, them being on the field, you're looking at 5% explosive pass rate. You're looking for an addition of 5% explosive pass rate over the 2024 baseline. The other big one there, Moses. This is huge. You're looking for pressure rate to sack rate reduction. Crazy. 24 down to 17. That's nuts. That's going to give you point that's going to give you 3.5 EPA over the right over the season. Now the defensive addition, so Milton, Carl Davis, Spillane, Landry, Chazon, throwing all those guys in there. With the improved wide receiver separation and obviously some short field opportunities from defensive upgrades, you're looking at expected red zone TD rate decline from roughly 47 to 56. That's above the NFL average. So what does that convert to? 1.1 points per game improvement. You might think, eh. What's, you know, a little bit more than one point a game? Well, <laughs> when you think about when you're talking about, like, let's, like, go with some of the Vegas lines, right? The betting lines. That means a lot, right? That's over the, I mean, that's not just every game. I mean, that's on average. 
Now we can go to the draft class. That's going to be an interesting one. That's going to add a whole bunch to it. That's going to add a whole bunch of war to the situation. Will Campbell, just on his first year, his war, 0.35. Henderson, 0.2. Kyle Williams, 0.1. Jared Wilson, if he plays, if he starts the whole season, 0.12. Craig Woodson, 0.06. Farmer, 0.05. Switson, 0.05. Borgalis is 0.02. Bryant, Ashby, and Miner. I have nothing for them. Nothing for them, at least. So, that together converted to wins. That rookie, that rookie war of .92. You're looking at almost a whole win just because of the rookie class. That's interesting because you have instant impact of Campbell. Um, obviously, the explosive offensive player with Henderson. And the other guys, the other four players likely to have 200 snaps. So, there you go. Now, the next thing we need to consider is the schedule. You're looking at a much softer schedule this year. I saw that the Patriots actually pointed out that their strength of schedule, 4.429, I mean... That puts them as a bottom three strength schedule, or I guess easiest schedule. So that should equate to facing a 6.8 win team on average compared to last year. Whereas the average for the NFL is 8.5. So that's going to correlate to maybe two, the two and a half win boost. Obviously, depending, depending on the roster and who they're going to play. So getting into like a full blown granular model. For win projections. Ready? So, full model. Baseline of four wins from last year, right? So, adding on. Second year bump from Drake May. 2.3 wins. Mike Vrabel. His impact. 1.6 wins. Free agent signings. 1.9. Latent 2024 rookie class. 0.4. This rookie class, 0.9. Strength of schedule, 2.3 wins. So that's nine total wins over four, four of the baseline. So that's 13 and four. That's the final projection, guys. And that's not even considering like true upside if Will Campbell hits early. May plays at the top 15 level, offensive line, possibly even being a top 10 unit. Travion Henderson fits in perfectly, opens up some like wide zone options, screen heavy packages. Obviously could easily outperform rookie running back war average. Um, kind of the more, I guess you would say, big hits would maybe be a Farmer or Swinson really, you know, hit. Plus, just them being in there, there's insurance war from them as well. But you're also looking almost a complete flip to possibly being potentially a top five seed in the AFC. This is not because of like everything hits. On average, the second year QB has an impact to helping out for a couple games. A good coach coming in who knows what he's doing is typically one half, two wins, right? Good free agent signings, over two wins. A good uh, rookie class, gonna give you one. Waiting for latency from the previous rookie class that didn't do well, roughly half. Strength of schedule, third easiest schedule, almost two and a half wins. It's nuts. So, anyway. Looks like, I guess, base would be like, what, nine wins, which is kind of hard to believe. And of course, you know, injuries would completely derail this. I mean, look at Belichick's last year. He had several major injuries on the offensive line, essentially your top three players being out for the season, for a good chunk of the season. I mean, that season was done with just injuries. I mean, everybody got injured, and he went from probably roughly 500 team down to, you know, what, four wins, 
Um, you know, not everything was perfect that season in terms of injuries and everything else too, but um, so there's a possibility that that nine win base could be easily chopped down to single digits, mid single digits. Um, but hey, 13 wins is a possibility it looks like. And you go from a basically a bottom five team to potentially top five team in the AFC. And yeah, that would be kind of like a commander's type of season, right? From last year. And they did very similar things too, right? They had a big hit on their rookie season, got a new coach, spent some money in free agency, did a hardcore, you know, digging up of their roster. They did a lot to make that a great, you know, turn that around in one season. So it's possible. And the other thing is that they're not the only example. Maybe, obviously, the most recent and most probably one that matches up the best compared to the Patriots. But there's other examples of this, especially if you do in certain categories where a team spends a lot or a new coach comes in or the second year uh, rookie QB or second uh, year uh, QB has a great season. All those things. So, you know, you're probably going to hear a bunch of people, great radio personalities are going to tell you, slow your roll. There's no way everybody's so optimistic about the Patriots. We haven't even played yet. You're telling me you're taking a team that went, you know, Four wins last season, they're just going to turn it right around. Well, guess what? Almost every, besides the logo and some of the key players, almost everything else is different. What, special teams coordinator coming back? I mean, like, what's that? Oh, yeah, in the front office? But coaching staff, a good percentage of the players, especially, I mean, God knows what it will really look like once we start week one. Yeah, that's how you change things around. What, how else are you expecting it to change things around? You know what I mean? And just so you know, I guess this is a perspective. I can't tell you any statistics on it, but it's like it's a debate team strategy. And you know, lawyers use it too, and just about anybody else that needs to win arguments. So when you're listening to radio, it's really easy to be pessimistic in sports. Why? Well, there's only one winner. Plenty of other losers. Everybody else is losers, technically, right? Didn't win the championship, you're a loser. And even when there's an, you know, an outperformance, an overperformance, somebody does a lot better than expected, of course there's always an out because something that wasn't there in the original model changed. And the person that was overly pessimistic saying it was going to be a bad year or this person's a bad player, they're like, well, I mean, we didn't know that this was going to happen. Exactly. Right? So, whenever you hear some, like overly pessimistic people that just want to dig in on the negative side of sports, just know that that's an easy way for them to always kind of be right and an easy way for them to be when they're wrong. Being able to kind of backtrack a little bit and sit on the fence a little bit more. You know, a lot of circumstances that they can point to that said, oh, we didn't know this was going to happen. I mean, come on. Nobody knew it was going to anything. You know, like, so anyway, I'm going to be optimistic because I feel it. We could see it already. There's a, just a good general energy around it. But most importantly, there's historical precedence. There's data that shows it. So... We're not going to say, we're not going to carve it in. We're not going to start hanging up any banners. We're not going to print those out already. We're not going to start stitching them up. I'm not pointing out a place to hang them already. But it's definitely giving you permission to be optimistic about the season. Because you're not searching for it. It's right in your face. There's a change. There's data. I mean, the optimistic side on this is... Only losing a handful of games. That's the thing. I'm not, we're not even going to like the full blown if everything hits. We're just talking what like average, average improvements would be. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you guys like this content, please like and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.